a, uh, a software uh, wizard, uh, Stanford, uh, all but degree, PhD, uh, an image processing expert. Correct. Uh, take it away, Tali. All right. So I'll tell you a little bit about Silicon Valley engineers, what uh, we are like, uh, what makes us different from others. And the approach I will take is, I'll tell you first about myself, and the reason I'll go into a lot of detail is, uh, well, it is bragging if it's true, for one thing. And for another, uh, it will give you an idea of what's my background, so that if you're working on a project where I could help talking to you guys, I'll spend an extra hour after my talk, and just feel free to ask me anything that you have in your mind. Uh, my background is fairly diverse. Um, I will also tell you a little bit, if we have time, about uh, uh, traits of other engineers that I've encountered to help you understand in general what engineers who work in startups start start are like. And then again, if we have time, I'll tell you a little bit about um, what makes a startup successful beyond the stuff that you usually hear. Uh, in particular, it's the notion of state capital that comes from economics, and most people are really not aware of it. But uh, I think it's pretty important. Um, Q&A is going to be important. If at any point you have a question, just shout it out. Don't even bother raising your hand. Just say what you have to say. And uh, feel free to interrupt me. That's not the problem. The talk is very informal. So if you want to steer me in different directions, that's totally fine with me. OK. So first, I'll tell you about myself. And you have to know how old I am. I'm 41. And that's important because you'll hear a fairly good diversity of background, people that are 25, engineers that you meet in school might not have that kind of background. but Again, that's very reasonable for their age. And of course, there are engineers like Bob who have, well, more experience, but also they're older than me. So correct everything I say based on the age. Uh, I was raised in Greece, and then I went to Stanford in 1989 as an undergrad. And the first thing I did uh, was to work for three months at the Computer Science and Library organizing technical reports. And then after those three months of drudgery, I joined the laboratory, and we were working on a space shuttle experiment. It was uh, the tethered satellite system, PSS-1. It flew on a space shuttle mission 46, and uh, we really did have a problem with the mission. Something went wrong. Uh, nothing that endangered the astronauts, uh, but the experiment didn't exactly work as we expected. Specifically, we had this white satellite that was going to rele be released from the shuttle, still connected to the shuttle via a long wire, and that wire was supposed to extend to 20 kilometers. And well, it extended to 266 meters and got stuck. Um, we still got a lot of interesting science. Uh, my responsibility was writing the software that was uh, sitting in mission control. <coughs> and it would help us monitor, um, well, not it would, it did help us monitor our equipment. Um, how far we have extended the cord, um, electron emission, simulating um, the, the path of electron trajectories in outer space, doing all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, you guys usually see in movies like Apollo 13, the left room, that is mission control, and I was in the room next to it where they put payload operations, uh, meaning the group that manages the experiments that are on the payload. <coughs> Much lower security clearance to get to the right, but still. Uh, and I did that for one week. The previous three years was preparing for that event. Anyway, thanks to this uh, project that I did for uh, pretty much my whole undergraduate uh, time at Stanford, and uh, to my GPA, I got accepted to the Stanford PhD. And that's where I was until mid-1997. So when I went to the PhD, I started with uh, uh, computer graphics from the very beginning, and I stuck it out until the very end. Um, I did a couple of projects. Uh, the last one, of course, was, uh, was going to be my thesis, but by that point, as you soon find out, I didn't really want to stay in the PhD any longer. That was the first project I did. That was called uh, 3D, metamorph 3D Morphing. And, um, because I joined uh, with a professor, or my advisor at the time, was a young faculty member, I didn't have, get to have an office in a real building. I get to have a an office in a trailer. And in that trailer, I was the only computer graphics guy. All the other guys were electrical engineers. And so one fine day, around um, 1993, uh, after about a quarter into the program, um, I was uh, introduced to the World Wide Web. That didn't used to exist back in my time. Uh, the internet was around, but the World Wide Web was brand new, HTTP and all that. And uh, because I was doing graphics, the rest of the electrical engineers were pretty impressed by the stuff that I was doing because they really didn't know any better. It wasn't that exciting for the computer graphics community. But still, um, a couple of them were working on creating an index for the web because it was very interesting. So they said, well, why don't you have a page that has your work because it's so visually appealing? and we'll add a new category for you on our index. We'll call it 3D graphics. 
and we'll put your page there. That's the first one. And I did, and that was the page I put up. Uh, and then those uh, two guys asked me if I would be interested in uh, doing more for them. And uh, I said, no, no, Jerry, the internet is not really going to go, go anywhere. It's not really worth my time. It's just a fad. I just want to do my PhD. Well, that was Jerry Young and David Fyler who started Yahoo. So that was a very stupid decision on my part. Uh, the point being here that I may have been a brilliant computer scientist, but business sense, I didn't have it at all. Not during that time, anyway. So um, I kept working on a different bunch of projects. A couple of years later, because I was spending a lot of time teaching, uh, one of my ex-students uh, contacted me and said, we are doing this really cool, interesting project that has to do with organizing the web. I'm like, this has been done before, you guys. I don't really want to deal with that. I don't want to focus on my PhD. That was exciting. So I, I screwed up that one as well. Um, and by that point, I was realizing that I wasn't really going to get a PhD. And I really wanted to make money like all the other people that were leaving. So in 1997, I got the chance to uh, do something else. And I left the PhD. And I co-founded Invisalign. Invisalign is the company that uh, makes the invisible braces. Uh, the idea being, as you can tell, to turn Agri Betty into, you know, beautiful woman. Um, you can take, essentially, you put on braces, but yeah, people won't see them. Um, I was there as uh, a co-founder, and my specialty was taking the concept that wasn't developed by me, that was developed by one of the business guys, um, and finding a way to actually make it happen. Creating a, um, the concept was that you can put those retainers, those plastic retainers, but rather than use them to retain teeth, to use them to actively move teeth. And so that was the concept that was presented to me. And I knew about 3D scanning, 3D editing on a computer, and 3D printing, which was terribly popular. So I came up with a manufacturing product, pro uh, process. We pitched the idea to, to Kleiner Perkins and a few other VCs. We got the funding. Um, then I did the work for the patents, and the company went public in 2001. Now, in late 1998, I had already moved to Austin. And uh, that's where um, my life took a turn to the series, and I got married, and I got the dog, I got goats, I essentially, you know, established myself. And that's important because everything that follows, um, and all the work that I have done since then, was um, supported very much by my wife, not financially, but just being somebody there who, uh, you know, is there to, to help when things went wrong. And for that, I can't underemphasize the role that this has had in my life. So a supportive partner is about as important as pretty much everything else, money and all that. Anyway, I worked for Trilogy first. It was an e-commerce company. It was a great team. Um, but I joined without asking for any stock. I knew it was going to be temporary. I knew I wanted to return to California, but not physically, which really meant the next step, telecommuting. So in 2000 and 2001, I worked for a company called TechFuel. It was renamed to Physics. Uh, many companies at the time of the internet bust uh, were changing their name as a way to rebrand themselves and somehow survive. That didn't work out for that company. We crashed and burned. Uh, so it was a learning experience, as we like to call them. Um, the product was an internet appliance, essentially a cost <coughs> that provided a website with news form and so on. It was not a bad idea. It was actually a good, good system, good software, but really poor time. In 2001, I joined a company called Raplix, uh, which then was renamed to Centurum. And that company did data warehousing. Uh, I joined that company very early on. I was probably the second engineer. One notable thing is that um, earlier on, when I mentioned that I was teaching at Stanford, uh, I met, met a lot of people who used to be my students. And then uh, one of them was Michael Scherfer. And Mike uh, was, uh, what was he? was a senior engineer. And he was the one engineer who had joined before me at Traffic Center. You'll hear the name later on again. Um, and so I joined. Um, we spent a good two years building a really solid product, and then Sun Microsystems uh, bought us. And so I moved into Sun Microsystems for about a year or so, mostly transitioning my stuff to somebody else because I didn't want to leave the company dangling, but I didn't really want to stay at Sun either. And then um, came the repayment of a big debt. So what happened is that uh, my wife and I had gotten married in California, and my parents came from Greece. Um, and because they had come from Greece, when my wife and I went on a honeymoon, my parents joined us. And uh, because they saw some friends of theirs, the friends also joined us. So uh, clearly that wasn't the best honeymoon. And so I had to pay it back with interest. And because my wife is a long shark, I had to pay it back, turning a month into about two years. And so we traveled around the world. Uh, but the interesting thing here, and that's worth noting, is that it wasn't just um, 
goofing off. A lot of people who succeed in startups um, have this idea that I'll make big and then I'll just live in a house in the Alps and ski all the time. People who are in startups don't really necessarily do that in the end. Uh, your mind just works, doesn't work that way. You want to explore other things. So that's just what I did. So during that phase, um, I got computer science in Vietnam at the Hanoi Institute of Technology. It was a graduate course. Then I was an IT manager at the resort in Hawaii. Uh, I was also doing yoga teaching. And uh, after getting trained, I did permaculture design. Uh, I learned about photography and export new cultures. I met Hello Kitty. I did all sorts of you know, cool stuff. Uh, a lot of these things will actually f ended up finding their way into later on in my life. Uh, the work I did about photography has been very relevant uh, now that I'm at Facebook. At the end of that period, I was feeling a little bit, uh, how can I put it, antsy. Uh, it's, it's nice having fun, it's nice exploring, but I really miss the business and startup setting and the energy of a startup. Now, since I had done mostly IT and computer stuff before, I wanted to do something different. So, how about something really different? Uh, I co-founded Magnolia Creek, which is a, a clinic for the treatment of eating disorders. It's based in Alabama, was in Silicon Valley. Um, I did the financing most of it myself, but I had some you know, other investors. I was, in effect, the CEO, but uh, we didn't really put it like that in public because, first of all, I have an accent, and in Alabama, that's really bad. <laughs> uh, and I'm serious, it is. Okay, at some point, you had somebody call the facility. They got confused about what they told them. They called later, and they said, why do you have the Mexican housekeeper answer the phone? So that's, that's a true story. Okay. So anyway, in Alabama, I, did, I just didn't want to be on the, on the very front. Besides, I'm not a clinician. And ideally, in those clinics, or typically in those clinics, the head person or the front person of the company uh, is somebody with clinical experience. So my partner, um, despite her minority state, if you will, I was more than happy to have her be the front person. Um, so in this place, I didn't do much engineering. I did do IT, but IT, IT is not really engineering in the, in the regular sense. Uh, what was very interesting is I got to exposed to the South uh, and its own way of doing things. Uh, and again, there's a reason that you don't find startups in Alabama or Georgia, and you do find them in California, uh, and Boston and Austin. Uh, by the way, here we're not South, we're Southwest, so it doesn't count. <laughs> um, the other interesting thing is that uh, all of the staff, as well as my co-founders, were all women, and all the patients were women. And there's a very interesting dynamic having women in a company, especially when they are um, the, the majority of the staff. Uh, very interesting and, and a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> but a very different perspective. So a very valuable though, one, though. My exit out of this company was uh, a private equity company came, and they said, we want to buy you out. I said, no. Well, we'll give you a lot of money. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was OK, because they could grow it, and they have grown it a lot since then, much more than I could not being in the medical field. And of course, being a Mexican housekeeper, I just didn't do much. <laughs> now, the other thing that happened by that time, I was missing software engineering. Uh, I really like solving engineering problems. And so I transitioned to, uh, after the buyout, I transitioned to this company. Um, that was also another learning opportunity. Uh, the, what happened in this case is that we were building an open source platform for high frequency trading of financial instruments. Um, you might have heard the whole high frequency trading around the time of the crash being blamed for part of it, that's all bogus, but regardless, uh, the point is that we're building something with the target market being more of Wall Street. Uh, it was great exposure to a non-tech non -tech industry, which needed high tech, but at the time it was awful. We needed to raise Series B in the middle of the financial crisis, and of course it didn't happen. Um, we also made a bit of a mistake in our uh, strategy. I think we were too slow to deploy our software and get feedback from our clients. Uh, we were engineers, our target clients were not engineers, and we really should have deployed earlier and get feedback and go through an iterative cycle a little, a little earlier. Um, when that crashed, um, the, one of the people who had invested in that company, etc., was Mike Schreffer that I mentioned earlier. Well, Mike had become VP of engineering at Facebook by that point. And if you recall, I was teaching computer graphics when I was at Stanford. And so I had Mike as my student back then, and so at some point, they decided at Facebook that they wanted to be serious about photographs and not just upload snapshots and you know, have crappy quality, but really work with that. Plus, the volume of photographs was getting to be ridiculous. This graphic shows you how many photographs Facebook has. It's 132 billion. It is about 3.7% of all photographs ever taken by any kind of camera, excluding video frames. So you, know, you don't take individual frames as thousands as individual photos. But if you exclude that, you have about 4%. 
Um, so I don't know if you can see the text, but this is how many photos we have. That little box here is Flickr. That little oh, smaller box is Instagram. And that dot in the corner is the Library of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a huge amount of photos. And one of the things that I did when I came on board is to find a way to compress them in an adaptive fashion so that they take less space. Uh, and I was able to do it with about 27% savings, which translates into millions of dollars for the company, which is why they're okay with being remote. Uh, they're a company that likes people to be on site, uh, collaborate very closely, and we have about, about 20 engineers, about 15 actually, around the country, and we are all the main experts. Another guy written, has written the core of my sequel, for example. So those people can be remote, but everybody else, they have to be on site and you know, spend a lot of time together, which is great for them, but yeah, I, I can't handle it. Okay, so um, that was about me. So I'll tell you a little bit now about uh, startup engineers in general and some things I've learned about them. Uh, the first thing that, uh, and by the way, that's relevant because if you start your company and it has to do with engineering, you might want to hire one of those guys, like myself. So the first one is a lot of engineers, not all, tend to be pack animals, meaning that you find some people that you work with and that you enjoy doing projects with, you want to keep working with the same people, possibly across companies as they move around. The next thing is that uh, many engineers are nocturnal. Uh, that applies to me. I usually work, my best hours are midnight to 5 a.m. I wake up at noon, which is 10 a.m. California time, which is way, way before anybody else shows up at work in California. Uh, they usually show up at noon their time. Um, and it works great for me. But for that to work out, you need a company that's supportive of that. Uh, and not all companies are. The next thing is that not all engineers make good managers. There was this tendency, especially in uh, more traditional companies, IBM, Bell Labs, and so on, uh, that um, as an engineer became more senior, uh, they would be pushed, not necessarily forced, but pushed towards becoming uh, a manager of other engineers. Uh, the push could have been explicit or it could have been indirect in the form of you get more money if you become a manager instead of saying an engineer. Um, that didn't always work, because there are some people who just love to solve problems, and managing is just not something they do. Now, I can manage, and I know that from the clinic, but being remote and choosing to be remote, I couldn't be a manager. There's no way I can manage anything from here. The next thing is that the good engineers really love what they do. And that's relevant uh, when you're trying to find those engineers. Um, it's easy to say I'm going to go to the computer science school and figure out who has the right degree, or look at the resume on master.com or whatever. Um, that's not going to work as well, um, especially my wife is Asian, so I can say that. Uh, but if you're Asian and your parents made you become an engineer because you're going to make a lot of money, uh, that doesn't necessarily make you a good engineer. You might, but it might, it might not guarantee. So having the degree is not always a sign of being a good engineer. Some signs are very bizarre, like, you know, they really like Star Trek or they can speak Klingon. I mean, these are the kinds of things that you'll find among good engineers, but not all of them. I don't speak Klingon. Not very well, I mean. Okay. Now, there's a specific kind of engineer that you would want as a co-founder. Uh, and if engineers are pack animals, you want the leader of the pack. You want somebody like Mike Schreffer, who, when he joins a company or he believes in it, I think that um, I see value in that, and I enjoy working with him. So I'm not the leader of the pack from a from management standpoint, but I am from a tech standpoint. There are people who look to me when they're searching for a new job, and they ask me, but I would recommend and also tell them how wherever I am and we'll figure out a way to work out. The next thing is you want business savvy. Not all, not all engineers have business savvy. As uh, I told you earlier, business savvy is something that you learn. I didn't have business savvy as a PhD student at all. Um, the next thing is uh, you want good communication skills. Again, not all engineers have them, uh, but especially if you're going to be, if, if the engineer is going to be nocturnal, uh, when you actually talk to them, uh, you want to be able to understand what they are saying. <coughs> also, as a co-founder, they need to participate in pitches with you to VCs. Uh, they need to be able to explain their ideas and their concepts very well. Uh, they essentially need to be able to talk to people who are not engineers. And again, that's not always that common. They need not be your future CTO. A good engineer can remain the guru of a particular subject matter in the company and never become CTO, never become VP of engineer. Uh, so don't necessarily look for that management skill. Uh, they need to be able to help in the initial hiring and the assessment, but not necessarily the ongoing management. Uh, of course, as any co-founder needs to be hungry and ambitious, uh, but you guys know that already. The next one is more subtle. Um, you, you want people who are both specialists and journalists, and that's hard to explain. The saying goes, uh, jack of all trades and master of some, in this case. Uh, why? Because they have to be specialists in the domain of your startup. 
they had a lot of depth in order to be able to assess anybody else and write the prototypes. But generally, being a journalist is important too because startups can change course, at least in minor ways. And being able to adopt new skills is important. And lastly, if you don't know a good co-founder uh, in an engineering company, if you pick the good venture capitalists, they will help you find some. Um, the last thing that I want to tell you about the engineers as a group is that um, uh, if you want to, once you get them, nurturing them uh, requires a fine balance uh, in at least four different areas. The first one is micromanaging an engineer very rarely works. Um, it's not a matter of you know, it has to do with the fact that if an engineer has spent years learning a particular subject matter and there comes a business guy telling them what to do, there's always this what the hell do you know attitude. Uh, nevertheless, um, an engineer needs to know the business context. If you pick a business savvy guy, uh, use the fact that they have business savvy, try to help them understand what the, the, the context of the business that they're trying to operate and that they're trying to build, let them make the engineering decisions and discuss them with you. The next one is, um, again, I, if you haven't met enough engineers to recognize this, engineers tend to be a little bit OCD. That's part of what makes a good engineer. You start focusing on solving a problem, you become obsessed with solving it. That sometimes it's really not the right problem to be spending time on. Right? It can be, you know, uh, adding three extra lines to the code because it looks pretty. Yeah, it's important to me, but really it just doesn't really do anything for the company. So engineers need this help to get past their OCD behavior. Now, I'm half joking when I say this, but if you guys have a chance to see the movie Temple Grandin, uh, it's an HBO movie, it's about a woman who has Asperger's. Uh, she's very eloquent, she got her PhD, she knows how to design cattle shoots, how to get cattle to go the right way in a, in a cattle and get slaughtered. Uh, but she is autistic, uh, and she is convinced that the Silicon Valley engineers are, by a large, by large majority, have Asperger's but don't really know. The point, though, is that this woman helps you understand an extreme of positive behavior and an extreme of, uh, of obsession uh, in a very nice uh, movie setting that gives you a little bit of an insight about why an engineer may spend all night working on something that ends up completely useless, but somehow it's beautiful to them. Uh, anyway, help them out of that behavior if you have any good engineers, but in a gentle fashion. The next one is uh, to give them competitive compensation. Competitive means talk to your venture capitalist to help you find the right number. But if you give too little to an engineer, well, you don't want to give too much anyway, but uh, if you give too little, eventually they'll figure it out because engineers are smart even if they don't have business savvy. Uh, and when that happens, it can cause conflict. So you know, just, just be thoughtful about it. I've seen too many cases where business guys undervalue the, the potential contribution of an engineer and you know, things end up deteriorating quickly. Uh, and the last one is, if, you, if your company gets established and moves forward, create a setup uh, where you can have engineers whose compensation goes up, uh, even commensurate to a VP, uh, without necessarily then becoming a VP. So I don't know what VPs make at Facebook, but I know that as I'm going out on my engineering side or engineering track, um, definitely moving past a lot of managers, uh, compensation-wise. Okay. I have a slide that I can go through very quickly. This is about uh, software engineers at Facebook. And I added the name of our recruiter at the bottom, or recruiter at the bottom, just in case anybody is interested. Um, but the, the important thing here is that um, um, that's what Facebook looks for in engineers. But Facebook is not exactly a startup. Uh, nevertheless, because the teams are very small, individual engineers have a lot of responsibility, so they are startup-like, if you will. So the first one is. Coding skills are important in any engineer in a software company. Many languages are important because uh, systems tend to be heterogeneous. So we want people who can transition and use different systems. Each, in each engineer has a lot of responsibility because of the impact. Um, earlier on, I showed you a slide that showed you that we have 132 billion photos. Those 132 billion photos are maintained and all software for their upload, download, storage, maintenance, delivery is written and monitored by 10 people. So you have 10 people, 132 billion photos. These are the kind of ratios that uh, Facebook deals with, right? So if you have that kind of an impact, you need to be a responsible individual. Um, education is secondary to talent. Uh, we have people who have never finished high school, people who have never finished college. If they're good, they're in. Education is important, but um, not, not the deal breaker. Um, Facebook engineers tend to be a little bit good on a social front because we are a social company and we better understand our users a little bit. 
Uh, and the other one is that there is a bit of an ADD aspect, meaning that people change projects all the time. Uh, that helps them become generous, and, and they should enjoy the process of frequent bumping switching. switching. Um, we have two offices, Palo Alto and Seattle, and less than 20 telecommuters. OK, so that covered uh, my personal background, uh, my thoughts on engineers in general. And the last one that I wanted to touch on very uh, not, not too much that is what it takes to succeed. Now you know some of those things. Luck, right place, right time, right idea, all those things. <coughs> Capital, you want smart money, you want VCs who will not just give you cash, but they will also help you through. Uh, human capital, you want to hire the right people. Again, all that stuff is trivial. Civic capital is the part that is not that often appreciated. Uh, and especially because the word trust is, uh, some, some say it's a dirty word in business, to use the word trust. It is if you don't have contracts and if you don't understand the legal framework. Uh, the point is that trust and blind faith are not the same. Blind faith is bad. Trust is something else. Trust means that if I do get my patents, I can enforce them. If I do have my contracts right, I know that the uh, state is going to, um, or the, the state or federal government uh, will help me um, keep my employees, uh, force my employees to follow. Um, it means that I won't have the tax man come looking for a bribe. Uh, that's what trust is. It means trust in institutions, not a blind faith and no contracts and we'll just deal with it because we're friends. That's, that's being an idiot, I'm sorry. Um, you know, trust is, trust is more than that. Anyway. Uh, and one example, of course, is uh, customs of collaboration. Uh, defensive patents is something that you find a lot of people used in the valley. When a company gets a patent like Facebook, and I'm working on two patents right now, the idea is not to get them and then hunt everybody else that is using that uh, idea and get money from them. The, the idea is so that if we get sued, we can protect it. And that we can claim that we have a, a, a claim on the idea early on. Now, here's what happens when this trust is uh, uh, present. And these charts, uh, the different points are different countries around the world. So I'm taking the big picture now. Um, when you have a lot of distrust, which is what happens on the right, you also tend to have a lot of corruption in a country. So you're in a place or a country where there is enough trust uh, that you can assume that people that you deal with and your employees are not corrupt. You don't do the work they'll do. Uh, don't, assume, don't take this for granted. There are also variations within the United States, and I can tell you that Alabama is, is not very much on the left. Um, the next thing is, uh, what happens when you don't have this trust, and therefore you have corruption? What happens is that in order to start a company, you have to spend uh, a lot of work uh, processing paperwork and going through legal processes. To start a company in Greece takes, depending on the, on the business, but at least 300 days. Okay, and you guys can just go and file a certificate of incorporation, be on your way in like 30 days at most. Um, so trust is important, and the, that's part of the reason that you're here. If you, any of you are from overseas and plan to go back to India, China, Europe, or whatever, and start a company, don't ask if these are going to be as easy as in the United States. So there's a reason that Facebook moved to Silicon Valley when it did, no matter what our founder said about Boston recently. Um, I, I disagree with him. All right, now. Two more slides. Uh, the first one is to help you appreciate this class. Uh, what helps build trust? And why is it that in the US you find this trust and it works out? Um, it discourses like this. Uh, again, this is a study across many different countries. And what happens is that if you have a large gap between vertical and horizontal teaching, this means that <coughs> vertical teaching is uh, when somebody teaches you from a lecture and you don't participate, then you don't collaborate with yourself. Horizontal is where you teach other. Right, if you have the right balance, um, then you end up creating a lot of trust. Trust with your professors, trust to authority, and also trust among each other. Uh, so courses like this have a big positive impact uh, in your ability to um, f start this company and not be looking around behind your shoulder all the time about who's going to backstab you. And the last one actually brings us to current events. Uh, this has nothing to do with uh, uh, startups, but it's an also another thing that helps build trust. Now, you've been listening on the news about Greece and the mess that it's got in the world, and especially Europe. I grew up there. Uh, I was there in 1989, and I was there from the time that the socialist government took over, uh, saw the mess that they made, uh, saw the mess that uh, was not fixed by the right-leaning right -leaning governments afterwards, because they were just as corrupt. Uh, and you have to wonder, why is it that the society gets to a point where things are so bad, uh, meaning a society where there's so much distrust? 
Well, it turns out that a lot of this has to do with how much the concepts of tolerance and respect are taught at home. And of course, they're also taught in, at, uh, in, in a college setting in the US as well. <coughs> but the interesting point is the one on the left. Of all these countries, the one that has the least teaching and the least emphasis on tolerance and respect is Greece. And that's, that's the telling point about why it's in the mess that it's in right now. So, and that was an aside. <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Just to ask for some conjecture, how do you feel about the state of like engineering salaries like in the valley and here? And what do you think is where do you think they'll be two, five years from now? Well the salaries are there's a gap for sure. Um, part of the reason that I'm here is because I don't get to pay income tax and I have a California salary. Uh, and you know, and, and the salary is not as important, it's the stock options when they invest that, that makes a difference. Um, Salaries are going up in the valley because there's a lot of competition. Uh, when there is a downturn, like there was after the internet bust, they did go down a bit as well. Um, I would say that Austin will remain behind. Uh, I don't expect I, Austin I just to be Do you think engineers are being compensated fairly relative to the value they're adding? Do you think they're going to be compensated more? I wouldn't consider the salary as a part of the compensation. I mean, well, let's just forget salary then and say the whole compensation package, the stock options. And it, it is good, but an engineer still has to not accept the first offer they get. Um, yeah, it, it's important when you get an offer from a company like Google, especially Google, my God, those people are just <laughs> <laughs> um, But you know, even Facebook and other startups, it's important to first understand the, the contribution could make in a company. A typical engineer walks in, uh, making sure that they do well in an interview, and if they ask any questions, they are very superficial, fluff type questions. A good engineer who has not business experience will go in an interview and will also interview the company in the process. Figure out what they can do. And if through that, uh, that uh, process of interviews they realize that, hey, they really need me, they really need to ask for, uh, you know, to go into a negotiating round. Uh, but companies eventually um, will settle to a number that is, that is reasonable. In my experience, I've got to the point where it's, I, I go to an interview and it's more like, uh, all right, well, we know you have enough that you don't need to work, so what do you want, right? Once you get to that point, it's a different ballgame. But uh, because I also interview people as well, uh, I expect them to come back to me, and that's partly a test of their business side. Uh, <clears throat> when we last spoke, you were in the middle of an emergency. There was a holiday, and yeah. some servers went down. And why were you involved? That's a good question. That's a good question. In a typical company, you have software engineers um, develop the software, and then you have the operations engineers that make sure that that software, once deployed, stays up, it performs as expected, additional servers are brought online with the software installed to accommodate capacity. Essentially, it's a, it's a very clear division between operations and development. Uh, Facebook doesn't work exactly like that. Um, we do have our operations engineer. They do maintain the systems. But once in a while, uh, especially during periods where a lot of emergencies happen at once, software developers are expected to step in and help the operations engineers. Uh, and as a result, in order to be prepared for that, I actually do know a lot about how my software is deployed. That also helps because in a typical software company where you sell the software to customers, you typically don't have an idea about what happens once the software leaves the door. You'll get these bad reports on occasion, but you're not there to see it in action. In software, we write and we use our own software so I have a chance to see how it's used day in, day out, uh, and monitor its performance and, uh, and its bugs. Um, so that helps me in the case of emergencies like the one that uh, Paul was talking about, uh, where I have to step in the operations. And honestly, it's a fun distraction. And the other nice thing is it happens in a great time zone, because, you know, noon to five, I'm away, so fine. You know, if you guys in California are staying up late, then I'm like, yeah, woohoo, it's the middle of the day. <laughs> That's, that's partly why, because also work strange hours. Um, most of our operations are in Ireland. Uh, that also helps uh, time zone-wise. Uh, I tend to be in sync with them. Yeah. Most of Facebook is in Ireland? No, no, operations. Uh, our operations people, uh, most of them are in Ireland for the night shift. When California is uh, at night time, uh, it's the Ireland operations center that they saw. And so when they need help, they know they have to be in the United States. And that, that helps them a lot. Because normally you don't have a developer away when operations accomplish problems in Europe. So you, you mentioned there were three copies of everything. 
Yes, every single photograph is stored in three plate, in three different computers, which are in three different racks, which are in three different clusters, which are in three different data centers. So the point is that um, it's once we get the photo, unless you want it deleted, uh, it's not going to go anywhere. I don't think we've lost any data yet. Even if we do want to delete it? No, no. Unless you want to delete it. <laughs> you know Even if we do want to delete it. No if you want to delete no it. No copies left anywhere? Here's what happens. When you want images to be deleted, we mark uh, on a record that we want that to be deleted. The deletion doesn't happen instantly, but on the next um, compaction uh, cycle, and those happen every month or so, it will actually be deleted. Oh, okay. So, but yeah, it's, uh, it, but there's no anti-delete, because you know, once you mark it, that's it, it's going to go. And there's no offline copy somewhere? No, no. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll be <laughs> the thing that we have, there's no way that we could do offline copies. Uh, we take backups of our databases, like um, which, which things you like or dislike, any comments that you make. Those get backed up, and there are some offline copies for those. For photos, uh, it's three good. copies, and that's it. Video is the same thing. Um, I think I have three copies for those. Uh, can you. This, they're too big. Um, the amount of money that we spend on I can't tell you what it is, but it's a huge amount just to store all those photos. And a lot of the older ones, nobody uh, looks at again. Until timeline, which made it very interesting. Um.